This video could start like this. Let's start with the ranges of the various brass instruments. Or like this. from Middle Earth to the here and now. There's a lot to discuss about the brass section, so let's get started. The instruments of the brass family are all totally different from each other, unlike the string family, for example. Even the way the brass is laid out on an orchestral score has some tradition behind it. The horns are above the trumpets, because traditionally, horns would combine with the woodwinds more often, and are like the bridge between the woodwind and the brass sections. The trumpets and the trombones, while resembling a sort of straight bore, are both totally different in their mechanism, and there are very few similarities between how they play. And the tuba, well, it has valves, and that's where the similarities end. And let's not even start on the flugelhorn, which is named horn, but actually belongs to the trumpet family, or even more confusing, the English horn, which isn't even a horn at all. First things first, let's start with the ranges of the various brass instruments. Defining ranges for the brass is a little more complex than with the strings, for example. The easiest way to talk about ranges is to define a safe zone for each instrument, which most brass players will be comfortable with. Playing outside of that safe zone can be difficult and require advanced playing techniques. You may find slightly different ranges of the same instrument or instrument groups depending on which orchestration book or chart you look at. And that's also why some sample libraries may go a note or two higher or lower than others. In an orchestra, we might have two, four, six or more players that need to hit the same note and in tune at the same dynamic and at the same time. And so that's why we stick within the safe zone and talk about comfortable orchestral ranges. Let's start with the horns, which you'll find on the top of a brass section in an orchestral score. In general, the range of a horn section starts from about a low C, same as the cello, up to the top F over three octaves above that. As we said, the horn can technically play higher and it can also play lower. A horn can actually get from a sounding F below the cello C up to a top C four octaves above. Marching on to the trumpet. It has a range of about three octaves. Again, the range is up for debate, but the common orchestral range starts from E2, the E below middle C, and a sensible top note to assume would be a top D, D5 on the MIDI keyboard. Maybe the top E if you're pushing it. And a great solo trumpet player can even get to the C above that. It's all down to the player. Trombones next, we have the tenor trombone and the bass trombone in the standard orchestra. The range of the tenor trombone is E1 to C4, so the E above the cello's bottom C, up to just over three octaves above, to the C above middle C. A good soloist might get up to the F above, but that's quite specialized. Similarly, you can also get range extensions for the trombone, which get you down to the C or the B flat below. I'm sure they're requested for sampling sessions, but they're maybe not guaranteed in an orchestral concert. The bottom of the bass trombone starts about a fifth lower than the tenor trombone, so from the B flat zero and goes up to around a G3 above middle C, maybe even a cheeky A. Interestingly, the fundamental note of a bass trombone is lower though, the E flat a fifth below, and so players are able to produce pedal tones below the B flat. And finally, the tuba, which has a range from D0 to F3. But we're sticking with the theme of telling you the notes the orchestra will hate you for. The tuba fundamental is also a B flat, the B flat minus one on the piano roll, like the lowest black key on the piano. And so it is possible to play lower than the tuba's D. The B flat might be uncommon, but the low C isn't so uncommon these days. Now, there's something important to note here. A brass instrument does not sound the same throughout its range. The sound has different characteristics in different parts of the range, and these subsections are called registers. You can't just transpose a melody line one octave up and expect it to sound the same, or simply copy one part over to another instrument. Your melody will end up in another register and have another sound. All right, now we could just go through the various brass instruments and their different registers, but I wanna try this another way with some musical examples. And as we're already going off the beaten track, let's also turn the order around and start with the tuba. It's pretty rare for the tuba to have a solo. It tends to lay the foundation for the orchestra, along with the double basses, and it pairs with the trombones quite often. 
So this is how I'm using it in this example. It's mostly on the low side, but I do move up the registers a bit towards the end. Let's get to the registers then. Right down at the bottom, it's lowest fifth, from C0 to G0, the tuba is meaty and thick sounding. Above that, from the A0 to the F1 above, it's plump, round and full. From the middle of its range, from that F1 to around A2, it gets a bit more nasal and horn-like. It's vibrant and resonant. And like much of the brass family, its last register, its highest notes from B2 to F3, are a bit pinched. Still sonorous, but not quite as loud as everything else. Let's move on to the trombones. My favourite thing with the trombones is probably using them for soft chords. They have a really amazing soft choir sound at their lower dynamics. The softer dynamics work a bit better in the lower registers. The sound of the trombone starts to stick out a bit as we go above the middle C, which can still be useful. We have the tenor and the bass trombones, so let's do the tenor first. The first register, the bottom octave between E1 and D2, is a bit thinner and edgier, a bit more hollow than its second register, E2 to D3. This second octave gets warmer and is more round and resonant. That's where these chords are sitting in my example. And then the tenor trombone's third register, between about C3 and C4, is mellow and sonorous, and it really sparkles at higher dynamics. That's what I'm using for the melody line here on the first trombone. On to the bass trombone. The low octave, below the tenor, from E0 to F1, is thick, metallic, and it's quite loose sounding. Then from G1 to F2, it's similar to the bottom of the tenor, very robust sounding, but maybe a bit more metallic and very strong at higher dynamics. And then the upper register, from G2 to G3, is sonorous and mellow. It's quite horn-like at lower dynamics, and it's not as brassy at higher dynamics. The trombones have quite a wide colour palette between the lower and the higher dynamics, which makes them really useful in terms of orchestration. Trumpets next. Opposite to the tuba, trumpets often get solos, but they're also quite hard to hide, even when they're not overly brassy, so they tend to be used a bit more sparingly in the orchestral fabric. The lowest fifth, between E2 and B2, is a bit thin and brittle, and it will always be a bit brassy. The second register, from its C3 to A3, you could say it was nasal, but vibrant. The trumpet is really alive from the third register though, from B3 to G4. It can be lovely and mellow at lower dynamics, and is rich and sonorous, and at higher dynamics, it's where the trumpet is most brassy sounding, and powers through the orchestra. The top register, between A4 and D5, is also very bold, but it's definitely pinched and shrill. It has a tension about it that's really exciting, and you can almost feel that it's difficult to play up there. And last but not least, the French horns. Like the trombone, the horn can play with a very mellow sound at lower dynamics, and get quite brassy at higher dynamics.
you could hear a bit of the lowest register at the end of that example. The lowest octave between G0 and G1 isn't used often because it's always quite a brassy sound, and it's a bit dull and hard to produce, and indistinct. The octave above, from A1 to A2, is much more like the sound we expect. It's robust and round, almost fluffy. In that second register, louder dynamics are brassy, but they're a little brittle. In the third register, however, between A2 and A3, they shine a lot more. Louder dynamics are brassy but rich, and from that A below middle C in a lower dynamic, the horn is wonderfully mellow and strident. It's really resonant and easily capable of being sonorous through the orchestra without being brassy. Horns also play chords together really nicely, and you can really exploit their large range. And their top register between A3 and G4 is also vibrant and sonorous, but it can start to sound a bit pinched, especially above the top C, but they're still capable of getting very loud and resonant. And combined in a section, those top notes are an amazing sound. Let me throw in some general info on how different registers behave at different dynamics. You've probably got the picture from these examples that whatever brass instrument, it's the notes in the middle of the range that are easiest to produce, and the most comfortable for the player. The lowest and highest registers have less control because they're generally requiring more air or more force to produce the note. This means that low notes can't come in from nothing, and high notes tend to be a bit harder to control dynamically. Also, in an orchestral context, the brass section rarely plays by itself. There are generally fewer examples of solo works for brass, and if there are, they tend to have a very different character, like marching bands or brass and wind bands. Those ensembles also include a wider variety of instruments, like euphoniums and tenor horns and other auxiliary instruments that you wouldn't typically find in a traditional symphony orchestra. And finally, unlike the rest of the orchestra, the brass instruments don't typically mix or blend well together. Their sound is very distinct from each other. The woodwinds, or the strings, can easily combine together, either in a texture or in unison. But with the brass, you'll get an ugly sound when the same thing is done, because there are lots of overlapping harmonics and overtones from each instrument. On that subject, as the brass goes into lower registers, the overtones and the overall quality of the sound is much more forgiving. Whereas a low triad in the cellos will sound muddy and unclear, trombones can do that with a decent amount of clarity. And the lower registers of the trombones and the tuba and other low brass instruments do work quite well together in combination. So the rules aren't really the same across the orchestra, which makes this all both challenging and quite fun. You might be wondering, why do the various instruments of the brass section sound so contrasting? And why don't they blend that well together? Well, that's rooted in the history of the individual instruments. And for that, we've prepared a little something for you. Enjoy our chronicle of the three kingdoms of brass and let us know in the comments how you like it. Until then, see you in the next episode. Mankind has always been inventive and inquisitive. Pick up a horn of dead animal like a buffalo and blow into it and you have a sound. And you also have the first version of a horn instrument. So technically the first brass instruments weren't actually made out of brass and wouldn't sound much like the brass you're used to hearing today. They'd have been made out of bone or animal horns. It's not until a bit later in human history that we see early straight brass-like instruments made out of wood or metal, starting in ancient Egypt or ancient Greece. These were used for signalling, for warning of enemies, or for hunting. Now, quite some time goes by and much of it is lost to history during a period historians hate to call the Dark Ages, and we find ourselves in the Renaissance around the 15th and 16th centuries. And we have not only just an early straight trumpet, but an S-shaped trumpet that looks very much like our modern day one. And they start off mostly being used for heralding, for royalty and pageantry. Four or five players would be installed in a court and play whenever anybody important turned up. Now, around the same time, we also have something very much like a trombone appear, a sackbut, a slightly bigger and better variation on an early slide trumpet. The sackbut is used for much more musical purposes, Composers actually write music for them, and at this point in history, if you're a composer, you're probably very likely to be writing for the church, and so much of the 16th century's use of brass is in church music. Those three kingdoms of brass don't come together until a bit later on. In the 17th century, there was the development of crooks for changing keys, still mostly for sackbuts and shawms, but in the 18th century, we also get some crooks for horns. And finally, horns become a proper musical instrument that composers write for, alongside sackbuts and the Baroque trumpet. And so from the 18th century onwards, 
we start to see a brass section forming. And then, in the 19th century, of course, we have the most development and redesign of all instruments, not least the brass, with the use of valves. And we start to see our modern counterparts appear, valved horns, cornets, and tubers, a modern orchestra. And the rest is history.